Hey there. The holidays are here, so it's good to know Ralph's can save you some time with free pickup on all your fresh favorites. Whether your traditions call for a hearty helping of juicy ham, ample apple pie, or Aunt Sue's legendary twice-stuffed stuffing, Ralph's has got you covered. So order for free pickup at ralphs.com or the app and get more time to get your holiday on when you grab your groceries curbside. Ralph's, fresh for everyone. Free pickup on orders of $35 or more. Restrictions may apply. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, December 14th, 2020. Today, the Manhattan DA is ramping up his investigation into the Trump Organization. The electors meet today to vote for president. The Supreme Court hands Texas a big loss. Can Trump's lawyers get in trouble for frivolous lawsuits? A sexist op-ed from the Wall Street Journal sparks a social media movement. Democrat Representative Bill Pascrell wants to use a civil war law to ban 126 Republican members of Congress from being seated. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court tells Trump's lawyers their lawsuit smacks of racism. I'm your host, A.G. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Dana, how was your weekend? Did you have a good weekend? I did. I actually, I, Sunday, I got to do a COVID safe uh, scene for a movie out on the beach, like just a little small movie for a friend, uh, but it's a super important movie to her. So we all quarantined and got tested, like long tested and then quarantined again <laughs> and uh, went out and shot this really cool scene on the beach. So I had a, what felt like a productive, creative weekend. Awesome. Yay. Yeah. I did nothing on Saturday and it was wonderful. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, that was that. Uh, that's what I remember most from the weekend. That and some re- really interesting news stories that uh, obviously popped up. Oh, my God. I can't wait to get into this. I mean, it's just like racism and this misogyny, like whatever you want to call this episode. It's going to be it's going to involve all of these things. Yeah. Yes. And. We also have, let's see, who, who we're going to talk to today. We're going to talk to Rick Smith. He's the host of the Rick Smith Show. Uh, he's going to be on a little bit later, and we're going to talk about whether or not uh, we should go after the Trump administration, um, legally speaking. And then uh, we'll be talking to Steve Hofstetter. He's he's one of the co-founders with Ben Glebe of Nowhere Comedy, uh, yes. the, the biggest uh, and I think probably only um, virtual digital online comedy club right now and and he and i are actually going to talk about a video he put out a couple of years ago about new california and how that recently came up again in the supreme court case um then of course you and i'll go over the good news it's it's a good show we have a good show today i'm looking forward to it all right we do have some headlines so uh let's hit the hot notes hot notes All right. The lead today comes from The New York Times, and they say state prosecutors in Manhattan have interviewed several employees of President Trump's bank and insurance broker in recent weeks. And this is according to people with knowledge of the matter. And apparently this is an indication that they are significantly escalating the investigation into the president, that he is powerless to stop. And I think that that's the key. It's (laughs) a beautiful thing. It really is. Mm -hmm. And the interviews uh, were with people who worked for Deutsche Bank and the insurance brokerage Aon, A-O-N, and are the latest indication that once Mr. Trump leaves office, he still faces a potential threat of criminal charges that would be beyond the reach of federal pardons. Now, the interesting note here, and I just want to say this, is that the New York uh, or the Manhattan District Attorney doesn't actually have to wait for Trump to leave office. There is currently no... Um, the law that says the president can't be indicted by a state, right, through state criminal charges. The Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel memo that we covered so often when we were doing the Mueller She Wrote podcast is just for federal investigations. Right, right. And and as you know, we've talked to Glenn Kirshner a million times about this. It should be challenged in court. It doesn't make any sense. It was this weird thing written after Nixon for some dumb reason. Um, and there are a lot of people who felt like, uh, the Mueller team should have gone ahead and indicted Trump for all of those obstruction of justice charges that they outlined in volume two of the Mueller report. So I just wanted to go on the record saying that they don't have to wait until January 20th. But then, of course, they would probably, you know, that would moot a lot of lawsuits that no doubt would be filed about whether or not the president can be prosecuted right. by anyone. 
Uh, it remains unclear whether the Office of the Manhattan District Attorney, Cy Vance, will ultimately bring charges, um, although I don't think he'd be sticking with this for a couple of years if, if that weren't the intention. But some people think that the grand jury here is an investig- like more of an investigative uh, situation mm-hmm. than to an in- indicting situation. But that, none, of, none of that makes sense to me. But the prosecutors have been fighting in court, like I said, for more than a year to obtain Trump's personal and corporate tax returns from Mazars which they have called central to this investigation. Um, the issue is now still with the Supreme Court. We haven't heard a decision on that. I think they're going to hear the arguments this term, uh, but we'll see how that goes. Lately, Mr. Vance's office has stepped up its efforts, issuing new subpoenas and questioning witnesses, including some before a grand jury, and that's according to people with knowledge who requested anonymity because of the sensitive nature. Uh, employees of Deutsche Bank and Aon, two corporate giants, could be important witnesses as two of Trump's oldest allies and some of the only mainstream companies willing to do business with him at all, (laughs) uh, they could offer investigators a rich vein of information about the Trump organization, the mother load, as it were. There's, again, no indication that either company is suspected of wrongdoing, however, at least not uh, as part of this investigation. But grand jury jury rules require secrecy. As we know, it's sacrosanct. Prosecutors have disclosed little about the focus of the inquiry and nothing about what investigative steps they have taken. But earlier this year, we've gotten hints because they suggested in court filings they were examining insurance, tax, and bank-related fraud uh, of the president's corporate dealings, the Trump Organization. So we will soon learn. I, 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 f- I don't quite understand why they're calling this a ramping up. It just seems to be a continuing of. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, unless this is like big time where they've been growing, 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 and suddenly they have like a big burst of evidence and, and uh, information. So we'll see. I mean, this has been going on for a while. We know that uh, since even Mary dumped the, you know, boxes and boxes of, of records from her f- into the SUV, you know, for the New York Times, <laughs> like all of this has been going on for a long time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how this actually plays out after he's done, which is in almost a month. Okay. Yes. Now this next story, um, it's this is oh god, I'm it's infuriating. I'm sure most of you saw Twitter explode over the weekend about this story, and one of the um, one of the people basically uh, re- rebuffing it now is from Northwest University. So this is <laughs> I, I'm having a hard time because it's just so infuriating. Northwestern University condemned an opinion piece, a horrible opinion piece written by a former lecturer, Joseph Epstein. I mean, seriously, Epstein's, you're giving your gender a really bad fucking name when it comes to women these days. I'm sure there's exceptions, but this isn't working out for you guys. Uh, In the Wall Street Journal, uh, it said, just suggested incoming First Lady Jill Biden drop the doctor before her name, despite her having a doctorate in education, which is the D in PhD. Um, It's just really, and I know this hits close to home with you, uh, as you are as well, a doctor. Um, and, and a lot of people added it immediately to their Twitter handles, which was a beautiful th- thing to see. But so the story says, while we firmly support academic freedom and freedom of expression, we do not agree with Mr. Epstein's opinion and believe the designation of doctors well-deserved by anyone who has earned a PhD in EDD or MD. <laughs> <laughs> D is the D operative word. D is the operative word. Uh, the school said in a statement over the weekend. So the rebuke from the school is the latest condemnation received by the op-ed in recent days, and it was far and wide. So in the op-ed, AG, uh, which has attracted a wave of backlash online over the weekend, Epstein referred to Biden, and I'm not kidding, as Madam First Lady, Mrs. Biden, Jill, kiddo. I shit you not. The last thing he said is, kiddo, while also arguing that the incoming first lady being referred to as doctor sounds and feels fraudulent, not to say a touch comic, as in comedic. Uh, The author of the opinion piece has dropped off the Northwestern website. Now, this is just such a bullshit article that the, the, the Washington Journal should have never printed. I understand it's an opinion piece, but this should have never gotten released. She's about to be the first lady of the United States. Uh, she's a doctor. And I don't know who this guy is who seems to be a lecturer who doesn't have the qualifications that Jill Biden actually has to write this was infuriating on so many levels. But Mm -hmm. um, the backlash has been far and wide. And it's nice to see the um, not just from women, but also men um, and to just come out in, in force 
and Forrest saying, this is bullshit. Uh, she's a doctor. And then so many mm-hmm. women put doctor in their names on Twitter. It was a beautiful thing. I loved that. That was my favorite part um, of this of this whole thing is that, you know, I tweeted from my personal account, uh, good day to update my name on Twitter. And I added doctor to uh, my Twitter name, not the handle, just my Twitter name. And the response has been overwhelming. Just hundreds and hundreds of people saying, me too, me too. That just people, mostly women, but men too, who never put the honorific in their name be just because of the shit you get for it. This misogynistic, stupid, sexist crap. And, and again, this does happen to men as well. You know, if you remember, Ross was a dinosaur doctor uh, from <laughs> France. Uh, he got shit for it too. But you know, the putting the honorific back in there, that tweet is up to, I think, almost 50,000 likes. And it's been at the response has been incredible. And it's just been very heartwarming to see all of these people add the doctor or the Esquire or the JD or the PhD to their name. So I, I absolutely love this. And I hope that this is now a settled fucking issue because seriously. It's, it, you know, in the workplace, I didn't put it in my email signature because I felt like I would just get people thinking I was just being too hoity-toity and uh, braggy about my about my education. Um, they, you know, it, it's just that hopefully that's over now. And um, I really appreciate the the overwhelming backlash that happened on social media it's just been outstanding to watch so thanks for that story yeah that, absolutely now on to, on to raw story this is from raw story uh about bill pasquale who's a democratic representative uh, and raw story says only one third of the republicans elected to new congress in 2020 will be seated in congress come january if one new jersey democrat has his way Rep. Bill Pascrell Jr., Democrat from New Jersey, argued on Friday that the 126 Republicans who signed on to that bullshit Texas lawsuit seeking to overturn election results should not be seated in Congress. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy on Friday joined the group seeking to overturn the election results in four states. Uh, Representative Pascrell believes that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment should be invoked to keep the Republicans from holding office. Here's what it says, quote, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any civil office, civil or military under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath or as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial of any other state to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. That's the 14th Amendment. Which seems pretty fucking clear. I mean... (laughs) Yeah. This is what it's for. That's what that section of the 14th Amendment is for. And Pascrell went on to explain himself, saying, stated simply, men and women who would act to tear the United States government apart cannot serve as members of Congress. The lawsuit seeking to obliterate public confidence in our democratic system by invalidating the clear results of the 2020 presidential election undoubtedly attack the text and the spirit of the Constitution, which each member swears to support and defend. Consequently, I call on you to exercise the power of your offices to evaluate steps you can take to address these constitutional violations. This Congress, any members elect seeking to make Donald Trump an unelected dictator. So he's going with this old Civil War law. Um, and I'm going to actually have a little bit of a discussion with Rick Smith about this a little bit later in the show. Rick says it, this isn't going anywhere. Um, I, I agree that it's not going anywhere, but but it's also disheartening because that's what it was fucking written for. I know. <laughs> like, that's this frustrating. Why it exists. Like, ah, uh, we, we, that's kind of old school. You know, we aren't going to. It's like using some parts of the Constitution and ignoring other parts of it. And I don't think that that's representative of our values it's the same thing it is the same thing they do with the bible i mean let's be yes. honest on the on the right it is the same thing they do with the bible they, they they cherry pick the parts that they want and they dismiss the rest so all right this next story is actually coming from a wisconsin supreme court judge who told an attorney for donald trump that the president's suit to toss out more than two hundred thousand votes in the state smacks of racism as it targets the state's largest most diverse counties which hold the highest numbers of black voters. Racism to its core. 
During a hearing on Saturday, Justice Jill Karofsky, a liberal member of the court, told James Troupis, this lawsuit, Mr. Troupis, smacks of racism. Justice Rebecca DeLay noted that the suit focused only only on the state's most non-white urban zones. So Trump and his campaign have alleged, without evidence, because there's been no evidence at all to this point. Bill Barr even said so. They have alleged without evidence that widespread voter fraud plagued the state and swung the election for President-elect Joe Biden. Now, similar suits filed in other swing states have been summarily rejected, as was a suit brought by the Supreme Court on Friday. Now, that was a big deal because I know a lot of listeners panicked. They, 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 People, I'm telling you, please try and breathe. He is going to throw everything he can at the wall to see what sticks. Nothing is going to stick. The wall, it's its just, it's not going to happen. I know you're worried. On You know, a little bit later today, depending on when you listen to this, uh, the Electoral College will have voted and, and you're about to get to that. Uh, in just a little bit, but just breathe, people, please. You're you're giving mm-hmm. yourself agina for no reason. Mm. <laughs> and we had a discussion last week with Josh Geltzer uh, from Georgetown, Georgetown law professor, and uh, I, you know, we had talked a little bit about this Texas lawsuit, and I said, how does Texas even have standing? In this case, and he's like, they they don't. Okay, well. Um, Interesting, interesting, because generally, and I I could be totally wrong here, but when when Supreme Court gets a case, they go through a couple of housekeeping things to when they decide whether they're going to listen to a case based on the merits. First of all, and I don't, this is in no particular order, but they see if they they even have jurisdiction to hear the case. Is this something that the Supreme Court hears? They do in this particular case have jurisdiction. Then they sit look at standing. Is the person who is filing this suit do they have the right to sue? This happened to Democratic members of Congress when they sued for Trump's tax returns. The, the court decided that they did not have standing to file that lawsuit, and. It is in the Constitution that states come up with their own election schemes, their own ways to to run their elections. And so Texas, I, you know, as discussed with Geltzer, doesn't have the standing to sue another state for how they run their elections. And then they look at latches and evidence and, and then finally the merits if they decide they want to look at it on the merits. So this case wasn't even dismissed on the merits. It was dismissed for standing, which is what my beans were on. And so beans come true. But they dismissed it because they lacked, Texas lacked the right to sue these four states for how they run their elections. So just a very interesting and hilarious and um, expected outcome for that Supreme Court lawsuit. Indeed. And all of the lawsuits. <laughs> it's like, they won in, won in 58 or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, some of them have been decided on the merits or right. they have been rejected for lack of evidence, latches. And and so there's been different reasons that these have been smacked down. But this this was the one for the Supreme Court. Um, and, and we'll be right back after this message. We've got some commentary on the SCOTUS loss, along with Bill Pascrell's call to prevent Republicans from being seated in Congress with the host of the Rick Smith show, Rick Smith. And then later I'm going to be talking with Steve Hofstetter about New California. So stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right Hey, everybody, it's AG. Uh, one thing you might not know about me, the shower is like the best part of my day. I, I love to spend time in the shower. Uh, I get my best ideas there. It's just nice warm water, especially in the winter. It's my one time of the day I get to really relax. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about our new sponsor, Nebia. It's backed by some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, including Tim Cook. Uh, it's designed by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers who spent years researching and developing a superior shower experience that saves water. That is huge for me. And it's anything but ordinary. The Nebia enhances your shower experience. It takes it to a different level. It's like a steam room, like a spa combined with an invigorating shower. After a Nebbia shower, I feel so relaxed and recharged. It's like I took a spa day. The Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower is Nebbia's most advanced shower yet, with twice the coverage, half the water usage of standard shower heads. Despite using 40 45% less water, the spray is 81% more powerful than the competition. Nebbia's atomized droplets rinse shampoo and conditioner out of even the thickest hair. It can be easily installed in 15 minutes. I did it myself. And you don't have to have a contractor or a plumber or anything. And uh, if you can change 
a light bulb, basically, you can install the Nebbia by Moen. Nebbia balances functionality with a clean aesthetic. It achieves a timeless design. It's available in four premium finishes, white and chrome, spot-resistant nickel, matte black, and black and chrome. And they offer accessories like shower shelves and shower curtains, which pair perfectly with the shower stunning, the shower head's design. And Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower starts at just $1.99. And for Daily Beans listeners, we have a deal for you. The first 100 people to use code BEANS at Nebbia.com will get 15% off site-wide. Nebbia rarely does a deal like this, so this is a great deal to jump on right now. So go to Nebbia.com slash beans. That's N-E-B-I-A dot com slash beans to check out what they have to offer. The first 100 people to use the code beans when checking out will save 15%. Again, that's Nebbia.com slash beans and use the code beans to save 15%. All right, everybody, welcome back. Joining me today is the host of The Rick Smith Show. Rick Smith, how are you? I haven't talked to you in a while. I am fantastic. How about yourself? I am good. It was a good weekend for law and justice. And uh, uh, that's some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today, if that's okay. Uh, It's fantastic. I got to tell you, I'm enjoying the winning. I think Donald Trump was right. (laughs) Uh, Maybe you get tired of winning, but this kind of winning, not so much. Right. And I, you know, I tweeted a while back, I think it was like day three after the election when all the mail in votes were starting to be counted for, for Biden and his numbers started going up. And we talked about this well before the election, that there would be this red mirage where it looked like Trump won the first night and he would try to claim victory. And he did. And then the numbers kept coming in for Joe Biden. And I'm like, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little bit of a sick pleasure out of watching him slowly lose over time. And I had no uh, idea at the time when I tweeted that how long it would go on, how long the losing would continue. So it's been fascinating. Well, especially here in Pennsylvania, where I'm at. Um, Pennsylvania, he was up 660,000 votes on election night. And I had people say, oh, it's a massive blowout. I go, they haven't counted the votes yet. <laughs> yeah. They, we, they haven't counted half of the state's votes. Uh, this is going to narrow quickly. Uh, and it did. It narrowed you know, quickly over time. And it, it was right where I thought it would be. Uh, extremely close. Uh, but, you know, Biden got the extra 80,000 votes. Yeah. And we we felt that way uh, in 2018 as well over here in California, especially when uh, that night, the night of the election, Carvel gets on MSNBC and says, oh, it looks like the blue wave didn't happen. And then over the next six to eight weeks, we flipped 42 seats. Uh, and so uh, I what think is it about people... Democrats? Look, if I can stop you, what is it about Democrats that they always seem to want to surrender? <laughs> I mean, you go back to Al Gore in 2000. What is it that you know, about Democrats where they don't ball up their little digits and get in there and throw a punch? They, they're just, they'll offer to hold your coat, uh, but they'll never throw a punch. What is that? Yeah, and I think that that, you know, it could have had, um, it, it ended up not, but it could have had some damaging effects by, you know, sort of making people believe that the blue tsunami that did actually happen in 2018 didn't happen. It's sort of like when Bill Barr came out with his interpretation of the Mueller findings. We, you know, we were like, oh, and it just sort of fizzled out, even though it was a complete, you know, just, it was just wrong. So um, what I want to talk to you about today, Supreme Court, the SCOTUS has thrown out the Texas Attorney General Paxton's lawsuit this weekend. Paxton is under federal investigation for bribery, by the way. And a whole bunch of other things. (laughs) But SCOTUS said Texas did not have standing to sue. Now, there are no new lawsuits in the system right now. The only cases left open are appeals to cases that the Trump team has already lost. So uh, my my basic question to you is, and I think I know the answer, is do you think we've heard the last of it now? So we we know the electors are meeting today. Do you think we've heard the last of it from Trump's legal team, or is this going to keep happening? No, it's going to keep happening. Look, they're going to fight until their last dying breath. Uh, and at the end of it, on January 20th at 12.01, they're going to complain that it was stolen, and they're going to continue to complain that it was stolen. I don't care how many lawsuits they bring. Bring hundreds more. Bring as many as you can so we can vet them all, and we can tell them every day, again, you lost by 7 million votes. You lost 323 or 306 to 232. You lost. Every day, we're telling them you lost. And they're going before Democratic judges who are appointed by Democrats, by Trump appointed judges at every step. Loss, loss, loss. And I think this is actually good for us as a country. The more they lose, the more it's it's put into our into our conversation that they've lost at every possible step at the ballot box, at every level of the court. And now in the, in the court of opinion, he lost. He lost by seven million votes. That is not a little thing. Yeah, uh, over 51% uh, of the vote. That hasn't happened since, I think, 1932 or something. 
um, quite a decisive mandate um, on, on this presidency. But the new argument now, of course, is that SCOTUS didn't hear the case on the merits, right? We had, I, I talked about this with some lawyers leading up to the decision about how we thought that the case would be tossed out on standing, meaning Texas doesn't have the right to sue Pennsylvania for how it runs its elections. Uh, but I did tweet, you know, I kind of wish this would go to the Supreme Court on the merits so they can be slapped down decisively and definitively for the for the reasons. But there are certain things, certain legal checks, boxes you have to check off before you can even hear a case. And one of those things is standing. Another is jurisdiction. Uh, another is latches. You have to have evidence. Uh, you have to have merits to have a merit meritorious argument. Uh, and I was like, this is going to be the thing where Trump says, well, they did it on a technicality. And that's what now he's he's, he's saying. Sure. But, you know, here's the thing. Um, I think it wasn't it Alito and and Thomas who said they would have taken it. Mm. But yep. he probably was still in a lost. <laughs> I mean, that's their guys. And the other part of this is what's interesting to me is we've seen these kangaroo court hearings uh, here in my state the day before Thanksgiving. We've seen them in Michigan. We've seen them in Arizona where Rudy Giuliani Trump's, you know, brings out all of these these. I don't know where you find these folks to you know just blurt out all this stuff. Uh, he'll do it there, but we didn't see it in the courtroom. You know, for me, you know, the courtroom is that place where we go, okay, what's the real evidence? And the truth of the matter is they had no evidence. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that they were willing to put under oath. So for me, you know, did they, did they do anything to get them in trouble? I don't know. And I don't really care. Uh, they brought their arguments. They lost. It's over. We need to, we need to get moving forward. Mm -hmm. Let them continue to fight the past. We've got to be looking towards the future because I don't know about you, but I know too many people are struggling to pay the bills. I know too many people are struggling to keep food on the table and a roof over their head while Mitch McConnell is holding this country hostage over his immunity shield before we'll give out any help to people. So at this point, the Democrats have got to be looking, how do we help people? How do we make people's lives better? Forget the past. It's done. We won. It's over. Don't gloat. Don't rub their noses in it. But go forward and get to work, get the job done, because we got so much to do. Our infrastructure is crumbling. We're, we're facing massive unemployment. There's so much that needs to be done. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just uh, you have your court things. Do your kangaroo courts. Uh, rile your base. Get them all tingly in the panties and wadded up. I don't care. We got work to do. Mm -hmm. And these things are kind of tied together, too, because in, in Georgia right now, we've got these two Senate runoff seats, which which could give us a very narrow margin of control in the Senate to make Mitch McConnell effectively ineffective, uh, which is why this this election is so important. But the Republican Party, with all of these lawsuits and all of these conspiracy theories, are really it's really just fracturing itself because now you've got a huge movement in Georgia of people who do not trust the system. They do not trust the process. As a matter of fact, I think 24,000 Republicans in Georgia didn't vote because Trump told them that mail-in voting was bad. And so he he lost that state for himself. He wouldn't have won the election had he gotten it, but it flipped blue because of, in part, because of that. I mean, we'll never know exactly fully all of the different variables that, that created that loss for him there. But the, the, the number of Republicans that didn't vote was is larger than the margin of the victory by, by Joe Biden in that state. So now they're all down there saying, you can't trust Loeffler, you can't trust Purdue. They didn't back the GOP. And at this MAGA rally in D.C., the, the million MAGA march, which is like dozens of people, um, which they put up a, f a photo of the March for Our Lives on Twitter and said that that was the actual photo of the rally when it wasn't. But, uh, you know, they're they're down there now and, and they're they're just driving this all these frivolous lawsuits, just driving this wedge into the party, fracturing it, splitting it. And they're chanting, you know, we're going to ruin the I can't remember what they were chanting, something about kill the GOP or something. And it's it's just fascinating to watch them in their own little circular firing squad yeah it's, it's finally it's good to watch them eat themselves for a change instead of the democrats doing that uh and, and the truth to be real to be honest this has been you know 30 40 years in the making uh they've created this monster trump didn't do this uh trump wasn't the one who who riled all these people up uh, this has been 40 years of right-wing dominance of talk radio. This has been a political movement uh, by our political right to, to make uh, unions basically impossible to join and to, and to, to, join, to be part of. Uh, this is about a massive redistribution of wealth from the working class of this country to the very wealthy and a political system that doesn't listen to workers. So for me, this was very predictable. 
Uh, on the other side of this, if you want a conspiracy theory, uh, the big conspiracy theory that I'm telling my Trump supporters is, is, you know, don't, I don't know how you think Democrats are that organized that they would have stolen the, the presidency and not given themselves a Senate and a bigger lead in Congress. Uh, you should be looking at Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell lost Donald Trump this election because he didn't pass the HEROES Act. Had they passed the HEROES Act over the summer and you would have gotten a check with Donald Trump's giant name on it, Trump wins re-election hand, hands down in my view. Uh, but McConnell didn't do that. Instead, held the country hostage for his pound of flesh. He had Lindsey Graham whining about workers getting an extra couple of dollars in their paycheck, uh, in their unemployment check. And you had a working class that's struggling. Uh, you always go to the polls or a number of people always go to the polls. How am I doing financially? And thanks to McConnell not passing that bill, a lot more people answered that not well. Yeah. And, and McConnell's not a he, he tends to not make errors. So it sort of makes you wonder why he didn't get that bill passed on behalf of the president. Um, I want to talk a little bit, and I think I know your answer to this already, but I want to talk about the 126 members of Congress who signed on to this Texas lawsuit. 14th Amendment says that you can't serve in Congress, Senate, state legislature, governorship, any political office if you were part of a plot, of a seditious plot to, to overthrow the government or to aid and abet our enemies uh, thereof. And so these 100, you know, Bill Pascrell, one of the Democratic reps, has put out a statement saying, Nancy Pelosi, don't seat these members of Congress. First of all, they are disputing their own victories uh, in these states that, you know, in this lawsuit, they're disputing their own victories. And because of, you know, because of the 14th Amendment, they shouldn't be seated. Now, this is extreme, uh, but it is in the Constitution. How, why is it we follow some and not the rest? Why Do you think this will go anywhere? I personally don't think it'll go anywhere, but I think there's... I think there's we run a risk of normalizing uh, this kind of shit um, if we don't. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that. I, I got two two thoughts. The first one is is these are cowards. Uh, they're they're treasonous cowards, and they need to be dealt with okay, uh, accordingly. Uh, they need to be taken out back and, and dealt with. Uh, we don't have time for that in this moment. There is, like I said, we're facing a global pandemic. We're on the brink of an economic collapse. We're, we're in this moment in history where, while I would like to take them out back and put them on the whipping post, uh, we got stuff to do. Figuratively, by the way. And it would be highly divisive and it would continue to give Trump another platform to maintain this. It was all stolen. And look, they're, they're persecuting us. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have time for that. I think we, we remember them, most certainly, may put them on a list come election time and remind people what kind of cowards they were, but we got to get moving. We got mm -hmm. stuff to do. We've got work to get to get doing. And um, this would be just just a major distraction. And you don't think we could do that, those, those two things in tandem? Because I know that when we didn't impeach Trump for the obstruction of justice in the Mueller report, uh, there were a lot of people that were upset uh, by now presidents, future presidents may think that they can just obstruct justice and get away with it. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, I don't think we're going to indict him on the federal level anyway once he leaves office. So we're going to see a lot of really unhappy people. Uh, I don't think uh, Biden's attorney general is going to have him locked up. I, I just don't see it. We haven't done it in the past. We didn't do it to, uh, to Reagan's people or Bush's people. Uh, we didn't do it to, uh, uh, H, uh, to W. Bush's people. I don't see it going forward. Some would argue that's why we're where we are today. No, I agree. But Joe Biden's not that guy. And Joe Biden's not going to put that person into that position to do it either. Uh, I think Biden's, my, his mindset, if you look at the people that he's he's pulled together, is trying to figure out how to get people between the between the curbs into the middle of the road, uh, mm -hmm. trying to somehow unite what, what can be united of the country. I'm of the mindset, and I said this the day after the election, uh, most other people were out, you know, doing their little things. I was on a, I was on a picket line organizing workers on a strike, and half of them voted for Trump. Uh, they were every bit of of America, uh, every social, every economic, every every part of uh, every where we divide each other. And in that moment, they were fighting the righteous fight, uh, which is against corporate greed, against uh, the inequality that's gripped our country. I think that's where we have to continue to focus like a laser and don't get off of it. 
uh, all of these other fights, you're just going to give the right wing so much fodder for their really their messaging machine. Uh, I say we got to we got to make people's lives better. And while I would love the the joy uh, of of beating them and holding them accountable like this, I I, I just don't I just don't think it's it's the right time. Hmm. And we also have to take into account uh, the fact that there are state level investigations criminal investigations going on. And so I hope that's where he's at. I've said, you know, if he does get arrested, if he does, if he's tried, convicted and sentenced and put into jail, uh, does he still get a a secret service detail in the shower? Uh, I'm told no. So, you know, good for him. Yeah. And and, I mean, some, you know, we think I'm it's good. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to, to not hold people accountable, but Again, I think it's going to be something that whoever Joe nominates as attorney general uh, is going to also be able to consider the fact that there are a full blown New York state level investigations into his business, his children and, and the man himself. And and if that weren't there, perhaps a different tack would be taken. But it is there. And so I think we have to take that into account. Let me let me, let me clarify this a little bit, because I, I don't want people to get a. a the, the wrong thought here. Do I want to, with all of my soul and being on a visceral level, uh, want these people held accountable and drawn into public square and court uh, in a very Machiavellian way? Absolutely, without question. Uh, the practical part of me, the, th- the part of me that says, do we want to win elections? Do we want to move the country forward? Do we want to do better for the people who are struggling? That's the part that's winning in me. Uh, do I want to hold them accountable, oh my God, do I. But there's just so much more that needs to be done. Uh, and look, th- it could take years to go through this. Uh, you know, th- how long does it take to get somebody to, to fight a subpoena to testify before Congress? Years. Well, Rick, we didn't get the Jaworski report. We didn't get the roadmap of the Nixon grand jury material stuff until two, three years ago. Uh, and, and so it could take decades before we really know what happened in 2016 alone, uh, let alone holding anybody accountable here. But um, well, we've got people who are hungry today. Uh, you look at the numbers, 25% of our children go to bed hungry at night. Uh, the number of kids who are food insecure has skyrocketed because of this pandemic. We've got so many problems. That's where my focus is. Mm-hmm. And I, I just want to clarify, I want to hold them accountable. I want them in an alley. <laughs> oh, do I? But we got too many things else to do. Yeah. And um, we'll we'll end it there. I, I have a little bit of a different uh, feeling about it. Um, I think we can do both at the same time. Uh, I don't know that we'll get a chance to find out, but um, we'll, we'll see how things start uh, on January 20th. And uh, happy Electors Day to you. The electors are voting, meeting and voting today. So we can win again another time. This is 986. So... <laughs> <laughs> we can just keep keep moving forward with a tired of winning hashtag winning. Uh, Rick, can you tell people where where uh, they can find your show, listen to your show, some of the guests you've had on? I really want to uh, share your show with with the uh, audience. You can find our, our website, thericksmithshow dot com. Follow us at Rick Smith Show on Twitter, Facebook, all YouTube, all of those places. Our show's live nine to eleven p.m. weeknights, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we also do a, a free speech TV show on Saturday nights at seven o'clock. Check your lo- local listings for that. Uh, we've had all kinds of, you know, from uh, I, I've had Hillary Clinton on the program before. Uh, Bernie Sanders was the first person I ever interviewed for this show 15 years ago. Uh, we've, we've, we've run the gamut, you know, between authors and, and, and politicians and, and experts. And uh, my favorite people are the, the working people of this country who make this country great, the people who've built the wealth of this country and for too long have gotten screwed. Uh, for me, it's about those folks. It's about my coworkers and my brothers and sisters and in, in the unions across this country and how we rebuild the most prosperous working class in the history of civilization uh, one step at a time. Mm, and we can do it. Thanks so much, Rick Smith. The ricksmithshow.com is where you can find it. I appreciate your time today. Uh, I, I thank you for, for sharing your points of view here. I, I, I like to get out as, as many different ones as we possibly can. Anytime. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, stick around. We'll be right back with Steve Hofstetter. Stay with us. Hello, Daily Beans listeners. It's AG. This portion of the podcast is brought by my favorite mattress in the universe, Helix Sleep. So for the past year, 
Actually, for the past four years, I've had a lot of trouble sleeping. I would lay awake, I'd stare at the ceiling, I'd toss and turn, I had a lot of anxiety. And I thought it was because of the administration that I was losing sleep. And that was partly it. But I also had a trash mattress. But not anymore, because besides Trump being the worst, uh, I got a new mattress from Helix Sleep. And I'm happy to report that my sleep issues have been solved. Uh, Helix Sleep understands you're unique. They customize the mattress to fit you in the way that you sleep. Helix Sleep created an online sleep quiz. It takes two minutes, and they use the answers to match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. So if you like a mattress that's soft or firm, or if you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or if you sleep hot or cool, with Helix there is a mattress, a very specific mattress, for each and everybody's unique taste. Like me, I was matched to the Helix Midnight because I like my bed medium firm, and I sleep on my side, so it's perfect for me. But you don't have to take my word for it, or Joelle and Amanda's word for it. They love theirs, or Jordan's. Everybody, it's the best mattress you've ever had. But Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress of 2019 and now 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. So just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it for 100 sleeps risk-free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it, but you will love it. And Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders for listeners at helixsleep.com slash dailybeans. That's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash dailybeans for up to $200 off. All right, everybody, welcome back. Joining me now is a friend of mine, comedian and co-host of the Ask Us Everything on Nowhere Comedy, Steve Hofstetter. Steve, welcome to the Daily Beans. Thank you, Allison. It's really great to talk to you. I haven't seen you since we did a sh- we just show together a couple few years back, uh, and so it's it's wonderful to have you back. I've been following your career. I've been watching your your audience roast videos uh, <laughs> as, as you put them out, and now your um, your Twitter account has become quite the uh the resistance account and it's absolutely wonderful to watch so i'm glad that you're here to talk to me today you know i've been leaning into telling assholes that they're assholes for years and you know now i'm just more focused on a specific type (laughs) well there's plenty out there especially if you were in dc this weekend but um the thing i wanted to talk to you the most about is i remember a video you put out way back uh well not way back january 2018 and the reason that I want to bring this up, and I think the reason you brought it up again, is because in that this the Supreme Court case brought by Texas and 17 other attorneys general and 126 congressmen, there were a couple of amicus briefs filed by states that don't exist, including something called New California. And you did a video about this particular exact thing, New California. You did it back in 2018. Can you talk a little bit about what the new California movement is and why it's absolutely ridiculous? Sure. And I, I mean, I wanted to file a brief on behalf of the state of uh, state of confusion. Like I thought that <laughs> that should be represented well. Uh, state of denial, I think, has a case. Um, the So New California is a movement. There have been several movements over the years of splitting states off. Um, the most notable is probably the northernmost part of California and the southernmost part of Oregon. Um, In fact, if you drive through it, you will see signs that it is the state of Jefferson, I believe, uh, one of the three different uh, places that call themselves the state of Jefferson. Um, And New California specifically was a movement that was started by a radio host under the guise of our interests aren't being represented. Mm. And that is what most of these splitting off state movements are. Our interests aren't being represented. And what the movement did in this specific movement is it basically was fanning the flames of racism, of xenophobia, of things like that. You know, they always talk about like, oh, the immigrant caravans are coming in or, you know, that they're taking our jobs, all those type of things. But really what it's about is taxes. Hmm. The people who are leading it are rich. They don't want to pay the California state tax. California taxes are higher than a lot of other places. And they make up this whole thing about how the government is stifling business and the real Americans and blah, blah, blah. And really all it is, is rich people want to get richer. And Mm. they are using poor people as a way to try to move their agenda forward. And and you had statistics about this because i believe somebody had come out and said that california is dead last almost 48th or 50 in the nation for being business friendly 
And when you sussed it out, what did you find? So that was the most incredible thing about the research is that the quote struck me as odd, 48th or 50th, <laughs> because that's not an expression people use. You would say 48th or 49th, you would say 49th or 50th, you would say somewhere in the bottom 10%. You wouldn't say 48th or 50th. It was so oddly specific. And so when I did a little bit of Googling about, you know, the best and worst states to do business, there were a couple of sources that came up. All of the reputable sources put California somewhere in the middle of the pack. There are benefits of doing business in California. There are drawbacks of doing business in California. I am someone who does business in California. I am used to this. However, there were two different sites, both of which cater toward very rich people. One of which said that California was dead last because of the taxes. And the other one that said it was the 48th. So 48th mm -hmm. or 50th, i.e. this idiot radio host Googled on the first page of, page of search results, found two things that supported his claim, despite the more reputable sources denying his claim, and used them in his talking points. Mm. <laughs> and, and so what, what was this radio host claiming it was really about? Because, I mean, how many times have we heard the Civil War was fought over states' rights? uh as a cover for what it was what was actually going on and i think you even brought up the comparison of virginia and west virginia at at, at that time um for, for for similar circumstances what 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 were their excuses for this i think it was you you said their interests weren't being met but a statistically or heard i should say but that statistically that's not true either is it no, it's absolutely not true. Uh, they're actually doing quite well. That's why they have the money to fund a bogus movement. If their interests are yet, why are they making so much money? As it turns out, their interests are exactly being met, proportionately anyway, because California is about two thirds blue. And that is, that is rec uh, reflected in the state legislature as well. Um, the number of, or the percentage of voters and the percentage of representatives is to the same, almost to the vote. And that is very rare for a state to be that reflective. Hmm. So what they're doing is they're trying to create this political fervor. They're trying to, you know, fan the flames of racism. And really, it's just self-interest. All it is is self-interest. And they're trying to, you know, it goes back to that. Uh, the, I think the book was called What's the Matter with Kansas, hmm. where it's, it's tricking people into voting against their own best interests. Hmm. Yeah, and I guess as it turns out, it's not that their voices aren't being heard because, as you said, they're being heard exactly proportional to how we vote in California. It's just that their interests are in the minority. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. And if we wanted to start splitting off states, we could do that. You know, we could have like uh, like Northwest Michigan could be called Michigan, and we could have, uh, you know, we could have everything but Denver be called No Colorado. Uh, we could, we could call, we could just break off Boise, make Boise blue, and call it Super Ego a Ho. Like there are a million reasons why you can split off states, and that's what counties are. The idea that we already have ways to locally govern in order to meet people's interests. We have counties. We have cities. That's the point of it. You're not going to agree with everyone in your state. I've played Fresno. I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Texas is a great example of that. Yeah, Texas absolutely is a great example of that. The Texas is almost 50-50 now, mm -hmm. uh, blue and red. It is, and it gets closer every year. And yet, land-wise, Texas is like 95% red, but land does not get represented. Uh, land is not a person. Companies also should not be people. That's another here, here. conversation for another day. But the idea of people trying to make it as, oh, well, you know, these thousand villages should count the same as this one city. It's like, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the number of people and the people's interests that are looked after. And while we should not forget about the interests of people that don't live in cities, we should not forget about the interests of people who don't agree with us, we should represent them proportionately. That's the point of a democratic republic, which is what we are. Mm. 
Yeah, and oftentimes they they accuse others of that which they are guilty. I mean, if we actually took a really good look at it, the Electoral College leans in their favor, and we have two senators representing Wyoming, and we have two senators representing California. So it, it actually their voices get a little more amplified than they ought to be. We aren't one person, one vote in this republic. Absolutely. The I would love, if they really wanted to start splitting off states, go for it. You know what would happen? A Republican would never win a national election again. Hmm. Because, because if you start splitting off states, even if you, even with gerrymandering, even with the ridiculous gerrymandering that has led to the duck-shaped district that you know, uh, that Jim Jordan, the, I, I mean, I was about to go off, but we only have so much time, uh, <laughs> represents, even with the ridiculous gerrymandering, the Congress is still blue. And so if you start gerrymandering states, the same thing's going to happen. Mm. You want to split California into, into five different pieces? Well, you know what's going to happen then? Four of them are going to have Democratic senators. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. We might actually get a little more equal representation in the Senate uh, than, than we currently have. So, the, but, you know, the Republicans are really good at shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, this circular firing squad that's happening right now, I was just talking to Rick Smith about it, is is they're, they could have a real problem in these Georgia runoffs because they're chanting in D.C., like, kill the GOP and we can't vote for Leffler and Purdue because they didn't support Trump. Write Trump's name in. There's not even a space to write anything in, by the way, on the ballot. But yeah, this this is not going to go well for them. Well, I mean, there's no space for writing in the Georgia runoff, which is why they provide crayons. You know, you have to you, you really have to want it, Allison. You really have to. It's it's so it, watching them implode is I do enjoy that. Um, but also there are genuine conservative people who simply disagree with politics. There are people who say, hey, I, you know, I support social programs, but I don't think we should pay for them this way. There are people who say, oh, I don't think Keynes was right. I'm a classical economist and I will debate with those people all day. And there still is a large part of the Republican Party that are those people and the people who are the Trump side of the Republican Party see those people as, you know, communist socialists because they don't know the difference between the two. They don't know that you can be you can't be both. <laughs> so they're going to tear themselves apart and, you know, let them. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch. I know that there's a, a cyclical deconstruction of the Republican Party every 60 years or so in this country. So it'll be interesting to see uh, where we come out on this. But I I, I think that um, and I'm, I'm like you, I miss having those big government, small government fiscal debates um, with old school, you know, now disenfranchised Republicans where they're going to find a home. I don't know. Uh, but you know, truth be told, this entire country has shifted to the left. Uh, and and that's kind of where the bell curve, the bell curve moves with it, if you're interested in, you know, status uh, uh, statistics. And so now you're you're kind of an outlier if if you're not coming along to the left. And this is we've seen this happen in other Western countries. So it's it's going to be interesting to see how our politics adjust, especially when it's so difficult to get constitutional amendments through because you need three quarters of the states. Yeah, the there there's so much that does need to change the electoral college being one of them the but if you just look at sheer numbers, Democrats have won the popular vote in 7 of the last 8 elections and that 8th was an incumbent president who barely won with one of the lowest statistical majorities in recent history. And when I say recent, I mean 100 years. Hmm. And so the country is moving left the despite the gerrymandering despite the disinformation despite the disenfranchisement it's still moving left um and that said our democratic party would be considered conservative in almost every other developed country mm -hmm. and, and so we're not really moving left we're moving closer to the middle when it comes to global politics right so you know we're just catching up a little bit and you know, you've got people like the people behind New California um, who are trying to use their money and influence to trick people into voting against their own best interests. And you know what? 
I've spent a decent amount of time in that part of California and that part of Oregon that, you know, wants to split off into Jefferson. And with the exception of Ashland, good luck. Good luck having any economy whatsoever. Good luck having anyone pay taxes. Good luck having roads. Good luck with your agriculture. Even the one thing that they have, they don't have enough of. It's not diversified enough. And the whole reason we have these states being larger swaths is in order to have interests met as a whole and not as an individual. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest difference right now in the two parties is that, you know, the Republican Party will say, what about me and my family? And the Democratic Party will say, what about everyone's family? Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the book. Uh, I think it's called A Libertarian Ran Into a Bear, right? This little town wanted to be its own libertarian thing, so they stopped all social services and all public services, and the trash piled up, and the bears came in and attacked the libertarians. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a, there's a method to to these things. Um, yeah, but it's... Yeah, you've got the... The donkeys, the elephants, and the bears, but they're actual <laughs> bears is the problem. They're actual bears. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to me today. I want you to tell everybody really quick about Nowhere Comedy. This is absolutely fantastic. I've had several friends perform on Nowhere Comedy, and everyone knows we could use a laugh right now. And so you have these incredible top comics. Tell us about Nowhere Comedy. Thank you. Uh, Nowhere Comedy is the first all-digital comedy venue um, we do not run occasional shows. We have 30 to 50 shows a month, um, with some of the most famous comics in the world. We've had, uh, Mike Birbiglia do about, you know, 10 shows. We've had, uh, guests on other shows like Jim Gaffigan. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, John Cleese had a show. We even had John Hamm as a guest on the Sklar's show. And, it's what we've done is we've taken what we believe, and this is something that I co-founded with Ben Glebe, and we've taken what we believe to be the best aspects of in-person comedy and how those shows are run and apply them to the digital space. We have showroom managers, we have bouncers, um, you know, there there's a security protocol. We haven't had one show Zoom bombed yet um, in the hundreds of shows we've done. And we also pay the comics very well. We have created more work for live stand-up comedy this pandemic than any other club in the country. Wonderful. And it's something we're really proud of. It's something we continually want to get better at. And we want to make the experience positive for people at home so they don't have to worry about spending a hundred bucks on babysitters and parking and food and drink. They can just buy a ticket for 10 bucks and watch a show. Wonderful. So you can support the arts, have a laugh, uh, and, um, Forget about life for a while. Absolutely love these shows. I've been to a few already. Uh, and and again, yeah, the names that you, you get are just incredible. So thank you so much. Steve Hofstetter, I appreciate your time today. It's been a great chat. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to go hang out in old California. <laughs> well, I'm in San Diego. What the fuck do I do? <laughs> You're in the old part, too. You get to stay. Oh really? I thought I thought I was in the new part. I thought they were like, oh, oh did they did they try to take things. San Diego because they want the military? Yeah, that sounds like them. <laughs> Maybe that's it. I don't know. Uh, all right. I, they, I think they just want our city council. They're geared for that. Anyway, I appreciate your time. Everybody stick around. We're going to be right back with the good news. Uh, stay with us. Hey, everybody. It's AG. Uh, earlier on the podcast, I talk about my past trouble sleeping, a problem solved by my incredible customized Helix mattress. Even cooler, Helix has gone on to start Allform to bring beautiful customizable furniture to every room in your home. Allform crafts gorgeous high-quality sofas and chairs to match your specifications, then they deliver them directly to you with fast free shipping. You customize your chairs and sofas to your specifications, and they deliver it right to you. And they use premium materials at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. With Allform, you pick your fabric, which, by the way, is spill, stain, and scratch resistant, perfect for pod pets. You pick the sofa color, the color of the legs, and the finish, and the sofa size, and the shape to make sure it's perfect for you and your home. Uh, I got a three-seater sofa and customized it with whiskey-colored leather, walnut leg finish, and a chaise lounge. It came in a couple days. I put it together myself. No tools needed, and I'm absolutely crazy about it. It's roomy and modern. Uh, normally, if you want to order a new sofa, it can take weeks or even months to arrive. And if you customize it, somebody has to come assemble it in your home 
it's just a pain. But All Form takes just three to seven days to arrive in the mail, and you can assemble it yourself in a few minutes. All Form has gorgeous armchairs and love seats, all the way up to eight seat sectionals, so there's something for everyone. And you can always start small and add on if your family grows or you move into a bigger house. Best of all, you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. And they have a forever warranty, literally forever. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash dailybeans. And All Form is offering 20% off all orders for listeners at allform.com slash daily beans. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. We had quite a bit of good news up front today um, with the one in 58 and the smackdown of the SCOTUS, uh, smackdown by SCOTUS of the Texas lawsuit. We have our listener submitted good news, corrections and confessions. And uh, Dana is here to read them with me. I am. I love this part of the day. It is the best part. I love learning about your listeners and seeing all the pod pets and babies and kids, all of it. It brings me so much joy. <laughs> Same. And if you do, if you want to submit your pod pets or photos or a good news story or a uh, dispute that you're having with a loved one uh, for Amy's courts on for Amy's court that ha- happens on Fridays, just do that at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. And our first submission is from Kai, pronouns they and them, correction suggestion. Hello, bean friends. I've been listening spiritually, I'd say religiously, but I'm not religious, since about the beginning of the pandemic, and despite my views, which are slightly further left than yours, I'm a devout anarcho-communist, I will always appreciate the metered and factual approach to the political news coverage you provide. The profanities and humor don't hurt either. I felt it was important to send a little message, since there has been much discussion lately about pronouns, trans issues, etc., pointing out small language shift that can make an enormous difference for the trans community. In your conversations for this week's Wednesday episode where you spoke with Krista Paravani, there was a great deal of talk about access to women's health care. I understand that this is perhaps a less jarring way of speaking about abortion rights, but it is trans-exclusive and harmful. And truthfully, other forms of women's health care, such as obstetrics, mammograms, and pap smears, are not being targeted in nearly the same way as abortion access. I personally know multiple trans men and non-binary folks who have had abortions and given birth, so it's very important that we include these people when we speak about our collective interest in retaining these rights. My favorite phrase is reproductive choice. It gets right to the point of what we're talking about without being in your face about the whole abortion thing. And it also doesn't harm trans people who are perpetually erased from these spaces and conversations by people with malicious intent. I know that isn't you, and I appreciate that, so I thought you'd want to hear about one small way to do better. Anyway, thank you again for all the great Big Gulps of Juicy coverage. It truly helps me with the shit storm. Kid and pod pet tags attached. The one with the bed head is my sweet little one-and-a-half-year-old gender-creative babe, oh Rune. Oh, my goodness. The black cat is Giles, and the white cat is Stud. The blockhead is Rex, who I've been, uh, who I've recently become a gourmet chef for. <laughs> Thank you, Kai. I'm, I will change my language. Thank you for that. I, it's just, I really appreciate you. Okay, if you see these pictures, <gasps> first of all, the baby and the dog following have the exact same smile, which brings <laughs> me so much joy. And that, oh my goodness. Rune. Oh, oh, let's see this cat. Oh my gosh, the cats. You know, what? this is one of the things, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you know, when I went before COVID, when I would stand on stage and raise millions of dollars for Planned Parenthood, um, one of the biggest things, and I don't think people realize this, that Planned Parenthood that people always see as a women, women, women is actually one of the biggest um healthcare providers for tra- our trans community. So it's one of the reasons we also want to make sure that we support Planned Parenthood because it's a it's a safe place for our trans and non-binary community to go to get their health care. So this is another just point for you to keep in your back pocket. Excellent. And yeah, reproductive choice. That's what I will, I like I will it. use that from now on. And again, if I forget, give me a nudge. Please, absolutely a soft nudge. This next one's from Anonymous, pronouns she and her. This is neither good news nor a confession, although it might be classified as good news because it brightened my day. A listener wrote in and talked about playing the pod at half speed. <laughs> I decided to try it, and it just so happened to be during a particularly gushy moment over a pod pet. It was hilarious to hear you two doing the cute good boy voices about a dog in half speed. I highly recommend it. <laughs> What a good boy. Look at the baby. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for that, Anonymous. Um, I'm going to do that later. I'm going to listen to the pod pet photo reactions in half speed. I haven't done that yet. 
Um, next from Melissa, pronouns she and her. So after being out of my apartment for nine days due to a water leak from the apartment above me, just above my sink area, I was finally, uh, uh, be back in my own place. I'll finally be back in my own place on Friday. I am really appreciative that my parents live in town so I could stay with them rather than staying either at a hotel or a friend's while the repairs took place. This is the second time I've stayed with my parents this year. The first took place from mid-March until late June during the early months of the COVID pandemic. As much as I like staying with them and eating their food, I much prefer being in my own place, enjoying the Christmas decorations I'd put up a couple of days before I had left to stay with them. I've attached a photo of how much the ceiling, how much of the ceiling was taken out oh and God. what it looked like on December 3rd. Holy hell. Jesus. That I mean, how much water is the upstairs person using? <laughs> right? Did somebody check on them? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's coming from their same house, like just as an upstairs room or from the upstairs neighbor. My god that's a serious leak somebody check on that person all right glad you're okay though that's scary because like ceilings can cave in and things all right uh this next one uh, no names given uh, but the pronouns are she and her forgive me pod humans for i have sinned you see i don't need to be able to read to know which christmas presents are for me i use my nose you can't hide them in the back of the tree silly humans for i am very good at hide and seek I couldn't wait until Christmas. I can't read that. Seems like a very long time in dog years. I hope you will still call me a very good girl. Love, Ellie. P.S. From Ellie's Human. Happy holidays and or happy new year to all the pod pets out there who have helped us cope through the crazy year. They've kept us company when we are lonely, calmed our anxieties, dried our tears, and most of all, made us laugh. Also special thanks to the people out there that aren't really pet people, but have uh, been indulging us while we share way too many pictures and stories. Happy holidays (laughs) to all a very happy new year. Hugs. Yes, she really did start opening her own presents. This is not staged. <laughs> First of all, look at the sploot. Look at the butt sploot. Oh my god, the legs split. I always call that like a ballerina sit because mm. it's just like a plie. <laughs> yep, that's nice. Yeah. And oh, well, there. Oh, yeah. the face. Though there is a face of like it's not time. Uh, look at the eyebrows. Oh my <laughs> goodness. This is adorable. Ah. Oh. Well, happy holidays and happy holidays to all the pod pets, even if they're trying to open their own gifts. Uh, Next up from Anonymous, pronouns she and her. Hello, Beans team. I wanted to share with you that I'm in the final stages of completing my graduate school degree. This has been a long road and I've been taking classes over the past two years in the field of sustainable tourism. My hope is with a degree, tourism can be used as a driver for stimulation of job growth in which the local community reaps the benefit and not big corporations. That's awesome. My last class was my thesis and it was so hard that I told myself, I do not know if I could do it. Uh, But then I thought about AG's pursuit of law school and remembered we are all badasses capable of anything we set our minds to. While the job market will be tough, I will put on my AG superwoman cape and grind through it. Best of luck with the pursuit of law school. You'll make one hell of a lawyer. We need people like you fighting on our side. Thanks for being a gleam of light in the darkness. Oh, this makes my day. Thank you so much. Al, you're a badass. Do you know how many people look up to you? That li- I mean, you do really give so many people hope of like just pursuing your dreams, if they, even if they seem hard. I'm just, mm. I just love reading these, and I hope that you take it in. I know sometimes it's hard to hear compliments about ourselves, but you've earned it, so just bask in it. I hope that you know when you have your bad days, you remember these stories. I, I absolutely will. And Good. yeah, I, I kind of have this weird like an atmosphere that compliments sort of bounce off of. Um, yeah. So send your compliments with heat shields and <laughs> try to make it through. <laughs> Ridiculous. All but right. I, I, I was just watching Apollo 13. Sorry. I guess I could do. <laughs> All right. This next story and our, no, not our last mission. We've got more of this. All right. This next one comes from Kate, pronoun she and her. And thanks for asking. Oh. On the show that aired Thursday, December 10th, Allison and Dana talked about the upcoming implosion of the former Trump Plaza Casino in Atlantic City, and Dana mentioned that she would like to witness it or see a video. <laughs> well, I looked it up, and it's scheduled for January 29th. My beach house is exactly two miles down the boardwalk from this lumbering eyesore, and I'm going to let my seven-year-old take the day off from online school, find a way that we can watch from a safe distance. I would invite you to stay at our super fun house and make a party of it, but it's a global pandemic. So instead, we will take video and photos to share with you. Thank you. The demolition of anything bearing the Trump brand will bring us great joy. I'm including photos of my awesome kid dressed as his heroes, Randy Rainbow and Steve Kornacki. (laughs) 
<laughs> and hanging with his five Barnavelder chicken besties, Rusty Blanca, Sky Lightning, and Freckles. All right. Okay. This Randy kid, Rainbow, Steve Kornacki, and chickens. Everything. Is... He's got the Randy <gasps> Rainbow eyewear. Glasses. Oh the Steve Kornacki suit. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And the khakis. And the tie. My the goodness. <laughs> and look, he's, he's looking at a map. He's looking at an election map. Oh, man. He really <laughs> is just the cutest. Oh. Well done with these pictures. It reminds me of that somebody tweeted um, on a, uh, election night or the night after, the day after that somebody's kid, somebody's a five-year-old, asked, like, when is mom going to stop watching the map show? <laughs> <laughs> What a honey. Look at this. Oh, the suit. Mm, that's fantastic. Wonderful. All right. I think this is the last one. Yeah. This one comes from pronouns she and her. Oi, yo. Uh, oi, you. Oi, you. Term of endearment in Oz. I'm like, is it we? Is it French? Nope. It's, Aust- it's Australia. Oi. Oi, you. Good news. So I am very high. Jewy. Oi. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oi. I, uh, good news. I am high. I am in Australia. <laughs> is it sad that the most amazing thing I can think of doing is to tell you, <laughs> AG and DG, that I'm currently high? But I live in Oz, Australia, and I just had a Christmas get together with my boss and colleagues. <laughs> Uh, what I mainly want to convey to you and Dana is the following. You're both amazing, empowering women. Dana, if you were in Australia, I can assure you um, I would be there to woo you. AG, if you were in Australia, I would introduce you to my wonderful and worldly big brother. Either way, you empower me every day, and I appreciate you every day for the words you speak. Truth to power. Thank you for everything you do, do for us Leguminati, and everything you do for the importance of the democratic system and fairness and the amazing and enlightening words you speak on transgender issues. I have learned so much from you. Thank you. I love you both. Good news. I'm happy. So many years I have felt empty and alone, and yet today, and every day since I was blessed with my pup, Chewy, I am happy. Attached to a couple photos of my savior and the one of the two of us at his first birthday. Get the hell out of here. Don't let me ever <laughs> visit you in Australia because I will put your dog in a suitcase and you'll never see either of us again. <laughs> he had pup lattes and woofles. Oh my <gasps> God. Look at this there he's perfect he is perfect oh oh is that like a golden doodle oh, it looks small man. though so maybe like with the oh and the mustache and the eyebrows this is so fantastic i am so glad that that pup is bringing you joy that is absolutely awesome i'm glad you're high i'm glad you have chewy i'm glad you have cheese <laughs> from one of these other pictures that chewy would definitely like to eat i love all of this oh you thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of the wonderful good news stories. If you have one and you want to turn it in or just send us pictures of your pets or your kids or your uh, house being repaired or your parents, whatever you have for us uh, in confessions and corrections too, just go to dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Um, we accept them all. And this is amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Do you have anything uh, you want to say before we get out of here, Dana? I do. I just want to wish all of our Jews out there a very happy Hanukkah, a very happy fifth night of Hanukkah. And um, to the goys who love us, happy fifth night of Hanukkah to you too. Mm, thank you. Uh, everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet and take care of your mental health. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is executive produced and directed by A.G. and Jordan Coburn and engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Industries. Our marketing manager, executive assistant, production and social media direction is Amanda Reeder. Fact-checking and research by A.G., Jordan Coburn, and Amanda Reeder. Our music is written and performed by They Might Be Giants. Our web design and branding are by Joelle Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our website is dailybeanspod.com. <laughs>